everyone. So good to see every one of you. So good to see you. And uh, I'm just, man, I'm just excited just to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. And you know, everywhere, everywhere we are, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. But everywhere God's people that we're gathered together, that's the house of God. And it doesn't matter if it's a storefront. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't matter if it's a field or a cave somewhere or a grand cathedral. It doesn't matter. Wherever God's people are gathered in the name of Jesus, yes. that's, that's God's habitation right there. Yes. I, just, I, I, I just sense the presence of God even already. I'm so thankful. Why don't we stand to our feet tonight? And uh, we have, uh, we, I, I don't want to say a guest. We got family here tonight. <laughs> Uh, our son Samuel and, uh, and uh, I, I don't even like to call Victoria our daughter-in-law because it almost seems like a downgrade. I mean, she, she's like our daughter, it really is. So and, uh, well, let's just open up in prayer as we always do and just invite the presence of God. Amen. Let's just let's just again. I encourage you to open your mouth, feel free to express how you feel to the Lord, and just worship. Father, we just come before you right now, in the name of Jesus, and we just worship you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you are faithful, that you are merciful and kind. Lord, we thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. God, we just invite your presence in this place. God, we ask you to move by your spirit, Lord. God, we invite your presence. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for all you've done for us. Lord, we just worship you. Lord, we lift up holy hands. Lord, thank you, Jesus. We are yours. Bought with the blood of Christ. Lord, we are yours tonight. We thank you, Jesus. Oh, we thank you, Lord. God, we believe you to meet every need that we have tonight. Spirit, soul, and body. We believe you, Lord, for your favor to rest upon this place. Tonight, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord, those watching by Facebook, God, we believe you for, Lord, just to, that you would touch them right where they're at. No matter where they are or around the world, we ask you to touch them. Lord, move by your spirit. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, you are king. You are Lord in this house. You are king in this house. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. Lord, we shake off the heavy bands and we lift up holy hands. We thank you, Lord. 
saying it on Tuesday nights, he could happen at any moment. The trumpet yeah. could sound tonight. Yeah. And when we get to heaven, the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5, you know what we're going to be doing? We're going to be worshiping the yeah. Lamb. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to be worshiping Him. You know, flowing, it was just flowing through me just a minute there. It's just that He's created us to worship Him. Get that? He created every individual even the person that's strung out on drugs somewhere, he didn't create them for that. He didn't create the person to be to be hung out on religion. He created us to be worshipers of him. To worship him. To glorify him. Not just on Sunday morning or when we get when we gather together, but all through the day, again every day, every moment of the day, there's a worship in our spirit that we love him. And how that comes out is just can be unique to us. But Lord Jesus, I love you. I thank you. You're so good. It can even come out sometimes in a devil, get out of here. <laughs> Jesus, thank you. Amen. The Lord is so good. I don't want to stop. He's so good. Praise the Lord. Praise God. You know God is so good. God is so good.
can we just can we just spend just a few minutes just worshiping him in your own way? Come on, just worship him. Hallelujah. Oh, we love you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. exactly what you're going through I just feel that tonight just to encourage you he knows we have a savior the Bible says he he is touched with the feelings of our infirmities he's touched he sympathizes with what we're going through that's young and old he sympathizes with us he knows what we're going through I know in, in hard times in my life, that was one of the most difficult things to comprehend. Jesus, the God-man, would actually know what I'm going through, but His Word says it. We have, we can, we have a, a great high priest who knows what we're going through. He sympathizes with us. He is touched. Hear that tonight. He is touched with the feelings of our, our human frailty. He knows. And he doesn't say, get out of here. He says, come. He didn't say, get away from me. He says, come. Come to my throne of grace. Come and ask of me in, in, in that time of mercy, in that time of need. And I'll give you mercy. I'll give you grace in time of need. Whatever we need tonight, if you need wisdom, if you need help, if you need clarity about anything, about anything. Yes. 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 It doesn't even matter. It doesn't even matter what it is. Yes. You may be, there might be some tonight you're wondering, I don't even I don't even understand this service. You know what? It's absolutely fine. Just say, Lord, I don't even understand. You know what? He's a good father, and he'll give you understanding. Yes. Praise yes. God. Yes. Mm. The Lord is good. Yes. Praise God. If we stop now, we could say, I've been in the presence of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a hand. Praise the Lord. Amen. You may be seated tonight. Praise God. Thank you, Samuel. It's good to have Sam and Victoria here. Amen. They will be moving up here yes. in Hallelujah. September yeah. and uh, and so it's, it's happening it's, it's, <laughs> God, is good. God is good yes he is and uh, so uh, but tonight we're, we're gonna continue studying the book of Revelation for the next few minutes and uh, if it will if it will come up on the screen we'll get it we'll get it up on the screen here and uh, praise the Lord come on. <laughs> there we go. It's coming. I think it is. 
Uh, is that thunder right there? Yes. Praise God. We need some rain. All right. Uh, all right. It, it's warming up. But we're, we're going to continue studying the book of Revelation where we've left off. And uh, if you follow along in your Bibles, you can turn to Revelation chapter 1. And we're at the very end of, of chapter 1. We're in Revelation chapter uh, chapter 1 and verse uh, 17. And so we're going we're gonna to turn there. And I'm going to put it up on the screen there so you can see it. And hopefully you can see it where you are. And we change directions. Uh, and we, it's, this direction is better because it's clear for, for you. But it's also that light is right there. And so, it, yeah. and so it's just better this way. But uh, in, in Revelation 17, 1 verse 17, and I'll put, all, I'll put some of these notes up here. Jesus, it says, or John speaking, and he said, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. And we looked at that last week, but when John said, I fell at his feet, that was a physical response to the presence of God. Just like we were feeling this, this, this evening, and the, the presence of God can be so strong that it can cause, it causes a reaction. It does, it causes a reaction. And uh, get this, we see that in the Old Testament. That's not just a New Testament phenomenon. That's a or phenomenon. That's not, a, that's not a New Testament thing. That's an Old Testament thing. That too, it's a Bible thing. In the presence of God, there's a reaction. So John, that was his reaction. But then Jesus, as we looked at last week, he said, I am he. And this is Jesus speaking. I am he that lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Yes. Yes. As we dealt with, like, amen. amen. <laughs> as we dealt with what Jesus said there, it was so powerful. It was like Jesus was preaching. And it was like a, one, a little one-line message. I am he that lives. I was dead. Past tense. And I'm thankful that you and I have a Savior that was dead, but he's alive. Are you thankful for that? Hallelujah. He was dead. Buddha, people, Buddhists can't say that. Those who were the Hindu gods, they can't say that. But you and I, as and every child of God, we can say that about our Savior, Jesus. He was dead, but He's not dead anymore. The tomb is empty. He's alive. Yes. And that was so powerful. Again, Jesus, amen himself. And He said, I have the keys of hell and of death and that just means keys there indicates authority and ultimately what through what Jesus did for us at the cross and he said when he said right before he died when he said it is finished and he died uh, that he paid sins penalty and it was through his death that he won the victory I know it goes that goes against natural thinking our natural thinking is, no, lie, live, live, live. That's where our victory is, you know, when, when we're alive. But in, in, in God's economy, we live when we die. And, and Christ's life is birthed into us through His death. And I, I, like, I like to think of it this way, as His blood, because life is in the blood, when His blood was being poured out of Him, it was being poured out of Him so His life could be poured into us. And that's why, that's why the, the, the theme of the Bible, as it said sometime, there's a scarlet uh, uh, thread throughout God's Word. Anybody ever heard that before? That terminology, that, that phrase? There's a scarlet thread throughout God's Word. And that scarlet thread is the blood of Christ. It's God's redemption plan. It's what He did for us at Calvary. And as it's been said so often, even I, I hear even more preachers saying this, Christianity is not about doing, 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 even though we do, do. <laughs> but Christianity, true Christianity, is about being done. It's done. It's done. And then, and we do just like we did just a moment ago. We worship on the basis of what of the victory that Christ Hallelujah. has won for us. Amen. Hallelujah! Amen. He's alive because He won the victory through His death at Calvary. Mm. And you and I are alive. You and I have life in Christ because of His death at Calvary. Amen. 
And so he would go on to say, uh, and we, uh, he wanted to say in verse 19, he said, write the things which you have seen. And as we, we looked at this a couple of weeks ago, uh, that's the natural uh, outline within the, the book of Revelation, verse 19. Write the things which you have seen, that's past tense, the things which are, that's present tense, and the things which shall be hereafter, that's future tense. Let me ask you, uh, all right, let me give you a little quiz, all right, just to, uh, okay. <laughs> Concerning the natural outline, the things which you have seen, what chapter was uh, um, what chapter was that? Where he kind of implied what it is. Past tense in the natural outline of the book of Revelation. Write the things which you have seen. Each one of these represents a chapter. Chapter one. All right, <laughs> Victoria. <so. laughs> they, they. I, I can't say they cheated, but they have. They've already. They've already had this class. <laughs> but uh, I'll just. Uh, and I, I'm not teaching, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really not teaching this as a class per se. I'm, I'm not really approaching it in that way. I'm really not. Um, I am, but I'm not. Uh, this is not a classroom. Uh, I'm not viewing it necessarily in that way. Maybe you want me to view it that way. I don't, I don't know, okay? But, uh, but we're all, we are students of God's Word. So I'm going to ask you questions. I do want you to know things like this. Oh, we do. It's important. All right, for believers to think, right? <laughs> so write the things which you have seen. That's chapter one. All right, the things which are. That's present tense. Everybody remember what chapters, though, that the things which are. Two. Two and three. Okay. <laughs> that was a combo answer. All right, with Vicky and Sharon Ray. Okay. <laughs> Chapters 2 and 3. All right, she's looking at her notes there. All right. So chapters 2 and 3, the things which are, that which represents the church age. And then the things which will be hereafter are chapters 4 through 22. Right. So uh, that's the natural outline. So, uh, and that's what, and, and, and the angel really gave it to, to John and to us, I should say. To us. All right. And then, um, uh, Verse 20, he said, The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand. Now this is Jesus speaking. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks or lampstands, the seven stars of the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks uh, which you saw are the seven churches. Now candlesticks, again, are really, literally it's lampstands or menorahs is what he saw. And it refers to the church. Jesus said it here. And as we, we've talked about it in the past, the book of Revelation is the most symbolic book there is in the Bible. But as we have also mentioned in the past, as, as it concerns symbolism, the, way to, the best way, the appropriate way to interpret symbolism is by finding, finding where that symbolism is used in the Bible. And, uh, and, and so, let it, so the idea is this, letting the Bible, as much as possible, interpret the symbol. Does, it, does that make sense? Yes. Letting the Bible interpret the symbol. And this, this one is a pretty easy one because Jesus is saying it here. So the seven lampstands, that's, that's, that's the church, that's you and I. And Jesus would say that in Matthew 5, in verse 14, he said, we are the light of the world. And, I, I'm, and again, I, I keep on mentioning in the past, but as I mentioned, I think last week, regardless of what's happening in the world, we are always salt and light. Always. Regardless, it doesn't matter if, if COVID 20 through 35 hits us all at one time. It doesn't matter. We're still... I know it's kind of a ridiculous thought, but it's, it's, it's a ridiculous world, right? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. right? So it could happen, I mean, from, right from China. <laughs> Delivered. Uh, anyway, uh, I, if there's any, uh, that's not a racist statement, okay? That's just, just making a statement, okay? <laughs> anyway, so, um, but if, I, if, some, if something, the next crazy thing that happens it doesn't matter. You and I are always salt and light. And it's really Jesus in us. 
salt and light. Uh, salt is a preservative. Light is an illumination. Light illumines, illuminates. All right, it illuminates, and salt preserves. And you, we, you know, it's when we when we look at ourselves. I know it's hard for us sometimes to think of ourselves in that way in the world that we're living in. But we need to view ourselves in that way. Even though I would say of all of us here that all of us individually, we're not, you know, we're not great event. We're not evangelists. We're not out there, you know, reaching. You know, whatever uh, people like like a, uh, a Billy Sunday or a Billy Graham or a, a, even a brother Swaggered and uh, like the, the, that God raises up very few of those. Yes. All right, most people are not that. But you know what? It's not just the great evangelists that are salt and light. It's every child of God that's salt and light. Yes. And I encourage you to view yourself in that way. Because even when we pray, get this, even when we, when we pray to the Lord, the Bible said, and we'll see it in Revelation, that our prayers go up as sweet incense before the Lord. And it affects even the spirit realm. I'm telling you, it affects things. When you and I as a child of God call upon the Father in the name of Jesus, it affects things. Have you ever prayed for your children before? You ever prayed for somebody, a, a friend that needs to get saved? Or you prayed about a situation and you committed it to God in prayer and you believed and you saw God work. Yes. Yes. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. That's salt. That's, that, that is in part a part of the salt and the light. And that's why it's so important that you and I, that we, that we, uh, uh, that we voice... Our, our testimony of Jesus Christ, again, in the world that we live in, uh, that we're not a secret witness, but it's more than just that. It's the Holy Spirit that lives within us. I tell you, it, it, it affects the atmosphere. At least it ought to affect the atmosphere. All right, so Jesus said, uh, he said here, uh, he mentions the seven uh, stars are the, are the angels of the seven churches. Those angels refer to the pastors <coughs> Excuse me. Of each church, and so Jesus would write to seven different churches, and each one of the churches, he said, it would begin with to the angel of the church of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, so on and so forth. To the angel. That's not referring to an angelic being like we think of angels. The word angel literally means messengers. And so what really what is being referred to here is he's writing primarily to the pastors because as a, 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 over a local congregation, the main person that God has put over that the, uh, as, a, as a shepherd, you could say, and as a messenger, that's the best way, the main person that God has put over a local congregation, even like this, uh, as a messenger is the pastor or pastors. All right, plural. That's the main person that God is to speak His Word. Now that does not mean, of course, that you don't hear from God yourself. You do. And as a messenger, I'm gonna, we, we encourage you, you hear from God yourself. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to call us on the phone. What's God saying? <laughs> Thank God for that. Thank God we don't have that type of relationship with the Lord. We have, each one of us has a great high priest. Right? And we can call on him, like that song says, we can call on Jesus anytime. Hmm. And he said he was those those angels were in his right hand. <clears throat> right hand uh, indicates authority in the Bible. <clears throat> so if you didn't know that, understand that right hand indicates authority. And uh, so Jesus, what's interesting, he's got, if you can just try to imagine the imagery there. Here's John is seeing Jesus, and in his right hand are the seven angels, the seven pastors. And so what is that telling us? It's telling us that in the church, because the seven churches really, as we'll get into, they, eventually, they, they symbolize the whole church, the whole church age. They symbolize, even seven, seven is God's number, perfection. There were more than seven churches in that day, <laughs> a lot more. 
And so the number seven really is a symbol, really, of all the churches. Even now, it's a type of all the churches. And, and get this, the highest authority in every local church is Jesus Christ. He's the highest authority. And I thank God for that. You know, for those, uh, and I'm not against, um, uh, some are, uh, I, I'm not against denominations. Uh, we're, we're, an, we're an independent church, but I'm not against a denomination. I'm not anti-denominational at all. But I have friends, and I know, I've known people in life that are, that are in denominations. Again, nothing wrong with that. But I've known people who are very, very denominational. And their attitude is, i uh, just use the AG for example, but it could be anything, uh, any denomination. If God moves, He's going to move through the AG. <laughs> yeah. Or they're a church of God like that. Or they're a UPC like that. Or they're a Baptist churches like that. Or they're, get this, there are independent churches like that. <laughs> When God, if God moves, He's definitely not moving through a denominational church. It's going to be an independent church, bless the Lord. So we can get proud of anything, all right. But God, but that's that. that it's interesting though that Jesus did not have the general superintendent in His right hand, or the general overseer. He had the pastor in His right hand. A lot, a lot more that could be said there because. Um, a lot more could be said about each one of those things, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, yeah. We're gonna look at uh, real quickly the four main views of the seven churches, and uh, when we when we look at chapters two and three, again seven churches, and but I want to give to you again four main views of what they represent. Okay, four main views of what they represent and there's some some of the things I'm going to talk about so that you may have heard of before and but some of this is it was it's interesting some of this uh, it, and as and even the book of Revelation in general there's a lot of pastors that will never touch the book of Revelation I uh, it, it does one thing that does it does in uh, it, it is intriguing to me is that there's more interest. I see a lot of interest in the book Revelation right now. With all that's happening in the world, I see a lot of interest about believers wanting to know about end time events. I see that interest. But there's so many that pastors that will not touch it. Because their attitude is, well, nobody really understands, and there's so many different views. And so, you know, let's talk about how you can be husbands, how you can be a better husband, wives, you can be a better wife, and you know, with children, you can be better children. So let's talk about those things, and you know, heaven, we'll, we'll find out when we get there. But that, that's not a right attitude, I don't think so. I don't think a right attitude at all. A right attitude, God created us for heaven, and Paul would say that we are citizens of heaven. That means if I'm, that's like, if we're citizens of heaven, that means that we should be, we should know about our country. Yeah. <laughs> right? Thank you. Yes. And uh, I know uh, uh, Jeff and, and Reba, who are not here tonight, they, they were showing us a book uh, written by a man named Randy Elkhorn. He wrote a book about, about heaven. And uh, it, 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 we were. I looked. I didn't. I looked at the table of contents and everything, and very, very. It looked very, very good. And the whole book is about heaven. And and so anyway, but um, uh, it, it should interest. So here, as as concerns these seven churches, number one, it represents this. They are they are seven. They were seven literal churches in John's day. All right, that's kind of. Uh, common sense. Seven literal churches in John's day. Number two, they are symbolic of seven basic divisions of church history. Seven basic divisions of church history. All right, we'll, we'll look at that as well in the future. Number three, they represent seven types of churches that exist today. 
Seven types of churches that exist today. For example, seven what does that mean? Seven types of churches that exist today. As we go through each church, it's interesting how each church was different. They were not all clones of each other. And, but they were different. But they were all, it was very interesting, they were all in a local or, or in a certain region. They were all connected by a postal route, actually. In that day, that was a big deal. And for us, not a big deal at all. But in that day, it was a big deal. All connected by a postal route in the area of Asia Minor. Uh, and, and, uh, but they all were different in, in their characteristics. And, um, and so they represent seven types of churches that even exist today. And then number four, they represent seven types of individual believers that can exist today. And so that will become more clear as we go through. So the first, and, and if you have any questions at all, um, please, please ask, all right? Please ask, and, or a statement, whatever, please, please make them. Yeah, Sheila? Are these mutually exclusive, or are they all characteristics of a main view, or a different view? The... Um, <clears throat> Say it again. <laughs> Four main views. Does that yeah. mean they're all separate and distinct, or are you saying it's all I, oh, one? I got you. Oh yeah. Yes. These. Yes. These are all one. So there, there's there's four different views, and maybe that's not the best terminology, but they're four different views, but they're really all one. So for for example, there's seven literal churches in John's day. That does not contradict number four. They represent seven types of individual believers that exist today in June 20, July 21st, I should say. Is it July? Yeah. yeah. July 21st, uh, 2020. All right. So yeah, if that doesn't answer your question, so yes, they all they all go together. All right. The church. Let's let's take a look at the Church of Ephesus, and we're we're um, uh, I promise we're not going to go too, too long tonight, but we're going to just cover some verses here about Ephesus. And now this is, um, as we begin looking at this, I want you to get the, try to wrap your mind around this. This is Jesus writing a letter to a church in that day. That, that even, all, all these years studying it, it, really, it still blows my mind. Jesus himself if you got a red letter Bible where the words of G, where the words of Christ are in red, this is all red letters here. The, Jesus Himself writing a letter. That means Jesus knows every individual church. He knows every. Of course, He knows every individual one of us. He knows us, and He knows us perfectly. And I've thought about it before over the years. You know, if Jesus. Uh, if Jesus was to write a church in years past, it was like if Jesus was to write a church, the church where I was attending, what would he say in that letter? <laughs> if Jesus wrote a letter, if we, if, if we had this today, if Jesus was to somehow, you know, wrote a letter, because he could have done this, you know, 2,000 years ago and put it in a time capsule somewhere. <laughs> and there's a prophecy about a church, you know, that would exist. 2,000, almost 2,000 years later, covenant, or it, you know, we find it in somewhere, <laughs> okay, a time capsule, covenant, this is the word, of, you know, I, I'm, I'm speaking to the angel of the church of Murfreesboro, Tennessee, okay, <laughs> I wonder what he would say, well, here, so I said all that to say this, that this is Jesus' personal letter to them, and he said, unto the angel of the church, again, that's the pastor, and Ephesus right. These things says he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, again that's his authority, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, sticks, all right, golden lampstands. He in other words, he Jesus he always describes himself first. He describes and he does this in every letter. He 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 writes to the says addresses the pastor, but he describes himself first. And this is how he describes himself. I am the authority, and I'm in your midst. And not just your midst, I'm in the midst of all of my, all the church. 
uh, the true, really the true church. And he said in verse 2, I know your works and your labor and your patience and how you cannot bear them which are evil and you have tried them which say they are apostles that are not and have found them liars and have borne and have patience for my name's sake and for my name's sake have labored and have not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because you have left your first love. Now I've, got, I've gotten ahead of myself a little bit right there. Okay, I should have stopped there. If we if you were if we were to stop at verse three, in verse two and three, I know your works and your labor, your patience. I won't read it all again. But if we if we stopped in verse 2 and 3, because of what Jesus did, and this is the characteristic of, his, of, of himself and how he addressed the churches, all of them. If he described himself, but then, get this, if there was anything good to say, he said it first. Did that? If there was anything good about them to say, he said it first. Now, if Jesus was that way, shouldn't we who are the body of Christ, be, have that same kind of attitude and mentality. If there's, even if we don't even like the person. That's a problem I think we have so much in the church today. And, and I, won't, I, won't, I, won't, I won't chase that rabbit, but there's so much division in the church today and so much controversy. And there's so, and you, know, you know why in part? It's because people, believers included, we love controversy. We just love it when there's a good Christian fight or argument or someone, some preacher blasting another preacher. We kind of, some people are kind of drawn to that. Yeah. Drawn to that. And, that's, and, and get this. Years ago in the church, that was more strong, there was a stronger, uh, and I'll, I'll, uh, this is not a bad thing, but there was stronger preaching against sin. All right, there was stronger preaching against sin, and there was a strong, and also there was a stronger, uh, to some degree, there was a stronger stance about what certain churches believed in. For example, if churches believed in, in Baptist churches, for example, if they didn't believe in speaking in tongues, okay, or whatever, that they were more outspoken about it. Uh, and but that's kind of changed somewhat. I've seen it change in Baptist churches I'm, in general. Pentecostal churches were more outspoken, for example, about the baptism with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Pentecostal Church, Church of God, AG, years ago, they were, that was much more being spoken from the pulpit. Right? Much more being spoken from the pulpit. But you know what? That... that the, 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 that, that can cause uh, division at times. And, 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 but I'm not, that, that, that's not the right word. That, okay, speaking in other tongues, that's a supernatural thing. And what happened is, as the church began to adopt more of the mindset of the world, like don't be confrontational, just don't say anything that would offend anyone, just speak positive things. And that really, that mindset came from the world, that the church adopted that mindset. And so, uh, uh, but, but I, I want to, I'm going to get back to the text here. If Jesus said, if there's anything good to say, he said it. And you and I should be that same exact way, uh, really about, about people. But then he said, And he said, <laughs> he has a voice like thunder. <laughs> Nevertheless, I have someone against thee. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because you have left your first love. And uh, again, if we stopped in verse 3, we would say of the church of Ephesus, the church of Ephesus is an incredible church. They're laboring. They're even a church that is able to discern false apostles from true apostles. Boy, don't we need that today? Yeah. Discernment. We need discernment in the body of Christ today. Between, and it's not so much discernment between holy and unholy. We need discernment between holy and almost holy. 
That's where we are. Because there's a, there's a, there's a lot of blending, okay? And we need, we need discernment. So they, get this, they had that discernment. They were strong in doctrine. But Jesus said, I have this against you. You've left your first love. You know, if there was, if there was one thing that, uh, one charge against any church that could be the worst that there was, that could be, it was this right here. You've left your first love. What does that mean? First, first love speaks of personal relationship with Christ by our faith and love in Christ and what He did for us at the cross. All right? That's really because that's how we got saved. We got saved by our faith, by, by the fact that He loved us so much. It's his, the Bible says it's His goodness that leads us to repentance, right? And he, he, he was, and we, that whatever that day was that we believed, we believed, and we, we believed that he, what he did for us at the cross, and he saved us. And in Romans chapter 5, Paul said, he poured in his love into our hearts. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, he said, by the Holy Spirit. He shed abroad his love, the love of God in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Now, again, every person is different. Everyone is different. But, and, and, and how they manifest their salvation. Now, there, there's similarities, but there's differences. Some people get saved, and they can run around the church five times. Other people get saved, and they're just like, this is cool. This is great. Wow. And, and, and it's, not, it's not any less of a justification because in the eyes of God, the words that just ran around the churches is, is and the person and the one that's silent, they're just as justified. Yes. Yes. All right, yes. all right. So the physical expression is it's just a physical physical expression. Uh, but but the heart, though, the heart, uh, to some degree, is it, it, very similar. Now there can be differences even in that as well. But I will say this: the normal biblical. The biblical thing that happens in, a, in one's heart is this, is that there is now, there's a new inner bent in our heart. We love the things of God. There wasn't that love before, but now there is. Yes. Get that? Now there is. Even if a person gets saved when they're young. Get that? Even if a person gets saved when they're young. And may that happen with most young people, may, may more young people get saved. Yes. So they don't have to get saved later on in life and go through the drugs and, and, and put their life right on the edge of going to hell. May they be saved younger so God can preserve them from all that. Because even in a young person's heart, the love of God is there. Well, Jesus said this. He said, you've left your first love. Jesus, and, and I'm going to, so Jesus is our first love. What he's done for us, he loves sinners. That's, that's our, for, he is our first love. Again, you know, what he's done for us. Now, uh, boy, we're, we're um, you know what, that's a big thing that we're about to cover next. So I'm going to do is, I'm just going to leave it right there, okay, tonight. I'm going to leave it right there. And next week, we're going to, we'll cover how did they leave their first love. All right, so uh, we'll come back next week and uh, and bring someone with you. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you've known someone that left their first love, bring them next week. <laughs> all right. I'm I'm being I'm joking, but I'm being serious all at the same time. But uh, but let's all stand to our feet as we end tonight. And uh, Sam, if you could come back and. Let's, uh, let's sing that God is good and God is so good again. Amen. Praise the Lord. And uh, so, again, I'm just so thankful for Sam and Victoria being here. Yay, Sam. And, uh, they'll be here on a regular basis pretty soon. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm just so thankful for Jackie and Rebecca yes. that have been blessing us as well. And, yes. and they'll be involved. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and there'll be others that will be involved. So uh, God's going to add people. He's going to add workers. He's going to add. And 
And uh, as I told you last week, if my prayer for you is if you can endure, if you're going to do our growing pains, then we can make it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's, let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord. Yes. And Lord, you're such a good God. We thank you, Lord, that you know us. And Lord, we're, we are in the palm of your hand. As your word says in Psalms, Lord, we are the, we are the sheep of your pasture. And you are our shepherd, Jesus. We look to you tonight. And Lord, we just ask that you would touch every one of us tonight. Answer the questions of our heart, Lord. Answer the questions of our heart, Lord, as we seek you, as we present every need before you. We ask you that you, God, would give us those answers that we cry out for. Give us provision. Give us favor. Thank you, Lord. Let your peace, oh God, fill our hearts and joy and safety and protection in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. we just ask you to bless the giver Lord bless this church God you know what we need and Lord you know what every giver needs God we ask you to bless press down shaken together and running over and we ask you for your favor Lord to rest upon this house rest upon each house in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus thank you Lord Lord, in the name of Jesus, your word says, God, that the devourer is rebuked in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Everything that would devour, it's rebuked in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Bless us, Lord. Bless your people. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Come give your offering. Love each other. We'll see you Sunday morning. Amen.